Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to talk to you about trees. Pretty excited about this. We have a couple books that we're going to get to, so let's dive right in. Our first book is called Nature All Around, Trees. It's by Pamela Hickman and illustrated by Carolyn Gavin. And this book is published by Kids Can Press. The green end pages. And it starts with contents, which tells you all of the sections that will be in this book. Trees are all around. Do you like to climb trees, sit under their shady branches on a hot summer day, eat apples and peaches, read books, or watch birds? If you said yes to any of those, then trees are already an important part of your life. The United States and Canada are two of the most forested countries in the world. Trees provide food and shelter for wildlife and help to keep the soil, water, and air clean. Their wood is used for lumber and paper. No matter where you live, you depend on trees every day. Take a look at the trees throughout these pages and discover how different trees have lots in common. There are more than 850 tree species that are native to the United States and Canada. There are two kinds of trees, deciduous and evergreen. This is telling you where you can find out more about some of these facts too. Trees make great homes for a number of animals, such as birds, squirrels, and bugs. Trees make their food from sunlight in a process called photosynthesis. And then there's a map towards the end so we can find out about the forest region that we live in. So trees up close. Trees are woody plants that grow at least three meters or 10 feet tall. Unlike woody shrubs, they have only one stem or trunk. Trees come in many different shapes and sizes, but they all have some parts in common. The trunk supports the tree. It carries water and nutrients between the roots and branches. Leaves make food for the trees from sunlight and cleaner air. They shade the ground, cooling the roots below. The crown is made up of leaves and branches at the top. Bark protects the trees and branches from extreme weather, infest infestation, diseases, and sometimes even fire. Seeds are often found in the tree's, free, true, the tree's fruit <laughs> or cones. After falling to the ground, a tree can grow in, a seed can grow into a new tree. Roots suck up water and nutrients from the soil and anchor the tree into the ground. Branches distribute the leaves, exposing them to the most sunlight. They carry water and nutrients to the leaves. Two kinds of trees. Have you ever noticed that some trees lose all of their leaves in the fall? or at the start of the dry season, but other trees stay green all year. In general, trees that lose their leaves are called deciduous or broad-leaved. In the spring, they grow new leaves and might have flowers that produce fruit. Trees that shed only a few leaves at a time are called evergreens. New leaves grow in before the old ones fall off. They're also called conifer, uh, most conifer, uh, most conifers, conifers, most conifers, sorry, are a type of evergreen that have needles or scales and cones. Many cones will open so that their ripe seeds can blow away. When it rains, the cones close to keep the seeds dry. So here is a white oak, that's a deciduous tree. Here is an Eagleman spruce, that's an evergreen tree. And then there are strange trees. Large trees are two kinds of trees at once. They are coniferous because they have cones instead of flowers, but they are also deciduous since they lose all of their needles in the fall and grow new ones the next spring. In the Southern United States, some palms and yuccas grow close to, close to tree size, but they are more closely related to grass than trees that you'll find in this book. Looking at leaves. Leaves come in all different shapes and sizes and they are important in identifying trees. Some leaves are whole or undivided. 
they are called simple leaves, like this shape here. Compound leaves are divided into small parts called leaflets, like this one. And those, those are the different leaflets. Use this page to identify the different trees in your neighborhood by looking at their leaves. An ash tree, so like a compound, you can see it has kind of a long skinny shape. A white birch is a simple one that's rounded. An American sycamore is simple and it is this kind of um, pointy shape like this. But you also have a red oak, which is simple, just one leaf. But you can see all of these parts of the leaf that's, um, they're all connected, so they're all one leaf, not leaflets, but they are um, shaped like that, and that's what an oak tree is shaped like. This is sumac, weeping willow, there's a maple, specifically a sugar maple. These are hickory, linden, mesquite. Um, why are leaves green, though? That's the question on the next page. A tree's green leaves are filled with a chemical called chlorophyll. When sunlight hits a leaf, the chlorophyll absorbs the red and blue light, but it reflects the green part of the light spectrum. You see reflected light, making the leaves appear green. Chlorophyll plays an important part in making food for the tree in a process that's called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis at work. The chlorophyll in leaves uses energy from the sun, water from soil, and carbon dioxide from the air to make glucose, or sugar, to feed the tree. Here's how it works. Roots absorb water from the soil, which travels to the leaf. Light energy from the sun is absorbed into the chlorophyll in the leaf, and carbon dioxide from the air enters through tiny holes in the leaf called stomata. Energy plus chlorophyll plus carbon dioxide plus water equals glucose, or sugar, that's the tree's food, and oxygen, which is released into the air. A tree's energy comes from a process called respiration. It involves combining glucose from photosynthesis with oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. This is the opposite of what happens in photosynthesis. Another difference is that trees res respire all the time, even in the dark, or they'll die, whereas photosynthesis cannot happen in the dark. When leaves take in air during photosynthesis and respiration, they absorb gas pol pollutants such as ozone, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and carbon monoxide. A leaf surface can also trap tiny pollution particles, removing from them from the air. In this way, trees help keep our air clean. A tree's life. This is about the life cycle of a tree. Most trees start out as seeds. These seeds come from the fruit or cones of their parent trees. Wind, water, birds, or other animals can carry seeds to a new place to grow where it waits for the right conditions to germinate or sprout. Watch as this red maple seed turns into a tiny tree in four to six weeks. The seed coat or outer shell softens. As it absorbs water, the seed cracks open to release the plant inside. A tiny root grows down into the soil. It absorbs more water to help the tree grow. Two cot uh, cotyledons or leaf seeds sprout. They provide the first food for the growing plant. As the cotyledons shrink, and form a pair of new true leaves at the top of their shoot. The stem continues to grow from the tip and more pairs of leaves grow out of it. You can start to recognize a small tree. Aging a tree. You can tell how old a tree is when it was cut down by looking at its stump. Wet the stump to reveal a pattern of light and dark rings. The light rings show the fast spring and early summer growth. The dark rings show the slower growth of late summer and early fall. In most cases, each pair of light and dark rings counts for one year of growth. So here's the bark on the outside, but then you can see the light rings and the dark rings. So together, that's one year. So we can go, here's the bark, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So this picture of this tree 
is depicting a tree that was 12 years old. I think that it's also interesting. You can tell that some of the rings are, are bigger than others, and it doesn't mention this in the text, but a really big ring can mean um, like a really good spring for growing, lots of food, lots of water, whereas a skinnier ring can mean that the tree was not able to get as many nutrients that year and didn't grow as much. Life after death. As strange as it may sound, a dead tree is often very much alive with unseen activity. When a tree dies and falls to the forest floor, it becomes a new habitat for an amazing array of plants, animal, and fungi. Different species live on top or underneath a log, under the bark, or in the wood. Some animals, such as woodpeckers, just visit to feed on the insects living in the log. Trees in spring. Although trees have buds all winter long, you sometimes only notice buds once they start to get bigger. When the ground thaws, the tree roots can again suck up lots of water. Water travels up to the buds, causing them to swell and eventually burst open. Inside a deciduous bud, you might find tiny leaves or flowers or both. When a leaf bud opens, thicker outer scales usually fall off. The tiny leaves inside unfold and photosynthesis begins to feed the trees. Instead of flowers, coniferous, uh, conifer buds, conifer buds open to reveal cones or needles. Here's some magnolia flowers. And pollination. Cones and flowers have to be pollinated to produce seeds. The wind blows the cone's pollen to a female cone higher up in the tree. The fertilized female cone closes and hardens to protect the seeds that will grow inside. The male cone eventually shrivels and falls off the tree. Most deciduous trees have flowers that are pollinated by wind or animals, such as birds, insects, or bats. Follow the honeybee as it pollinates a pear tree. A bee visits the pear tree's flower. Tiny grains of pollen from the flower's male part, or stamen, that's this part that sticks up, get stuck to the bee's legs and body. The bee visits another flower on a different pear tree. Some pollen drops into the flower's female part, or pistil. That's this part here. The pollen grains germinate and release male reproductive cells. These travel down the pistil to unite with the eggs, egg cells in the flower's ovary. This is called fertilization. Once the flower is fertilized, seeds will develop inside the ovary and the rest of the flower falls off the tree. The ovary develops into a thick fleshy covering around the seeds and this becomes a pear. Um, flowering trees. In early spring, most deciduous trees have flowers. Trees such as black cherries, black cherry pop plums produce flowers before leaves. So do willows, alders, and poplars. This can be an advantage during pollination. Large leaves can crowd the flowers, getting in the way of wind or animal pollinators. Some oak and beech trees produce their leaves and flowers at roughly the same time. Others produce their leaves first. Here's a picture of the black cherry plum flowers. Trees in summer. Most of a tree's growth happens during the warm days of summer. Trees grow in two ways, length and width. A tree grows longer because of special living cells at the tip of the branches and roots. As these special cells divide and lengthen, they push the branches outwards and the roots downwards. The trunk and branches grow wider because of a very thin layer of living cells called cambium. On the outside of the cambium lies the phloem, or inner bark. Food from the leaves is transported to the rest of the trunk through tube-like structures in the phloem. As the cambium produces new phloem cells, the old ones get pushed out and crushed and then die. The dead cells form the tree's bark. On the inside of the cambium lies the xylem, or living sapwood. Its tube-like structures carry water and nutrients up from the roots to the leaves. As the cambium produces new xylem cells, the older cells die and turn to heartwood. Most of a tree trunk is made of heartwood. So heartwood's the middle part, and then you have xylem, cabium, phloem, and the bark. Nut trees. During summer, a tree's fruit grows and ripens. A nut is actually a kind of fruit that has hard shell within a seed, with a seed inside. Tree nuts 
True nuts, such as chestnuts, acorns, and hazelnuts, have a shell that doesn't open when the nut is ripe. Other things that we call nuts, such as pecans, almonds, and walnuts, are actually the seeds of fruit. They have a softer, fleshy outer layer that usually rots to release the edible seed inside. So here are like chestnuts, almonds, and walnuts in their coverings. But here are hazelnut and pecans too, and here's acorns and hazelnuts, which do not have um, the shell. Strange trees. Here's another strange tree. The largest tree in the world, nicknamed, nicknamed General Sherman, is a giant sequoia in California's Sequoia National Park. The tree probably started growing about 2,000 years ago. Some sequoias live to be 3,200 years old, so General Sherman is only middle-aged. It is as tall as a 23-story building, and you would have to join hands with at least 24 of your friends to reach around the the tree trunk trees in fall when the summertime greens of deciduous trees turn to reds yellows oranges and purples you know that fall has arrived these colors are actually in the leaves all summer long but they're hidden by the chlorophyll during photosynthesis when the fall comes leaves stop making chlorophyll soon after the green color disappears and the other colors take over each tree has its own mixture of pigments that give the leaves their color. Leaves that have carotenoid pigments will turn orange or yellow, while ones that have the anthocyanin pigment will turn red or purple. That's why we see so many different colors in the fall. Falling leaves. When the daylight gets shorter and the cold fall weather sets in, deciduous trees prepare for the coming winter. Just like a hibernating animal, trees rest during the cold month. They also stop growing. Once the ground freezes, the roots can't absorb water from the soil. So a thin, la excuse me, a thin layer of cells, like a scab, grows between the tree branch and the leaf. Each leaf is cut off from the tree's supply of water and nutrients, and eventually the leaf falls off the tree. You can see there's like the scab there. Unlike deciduous trees, evergreens keep their needles all year round. A thick, waxy layer covers the needles and prevents water loss during the colder months. As long as an evergreen has some water and sunlight, it can undergo photosynthesis. But in late fall, when the water in the ground is frozen, evergreens go dormant until the warmer weather resumes. Strange trees. Big leaf maples get their name from the enormous leaves. They are the largest leaves of any maple tree species and can grow wider than this page. Think about how big of a leaf that would be if you can picture my hand compared to a leaf. A big leaf's bark is special too. It soaks up water so that it is always damp and this makes it a great place for ferns, moss, and liverworts to grow. A big old oak tree may drop up to 700,000 leaves in the fall. In warmer climates, deciduous trees drop their leaves at the beginning of the dry season trees in winter. In the cold winter months, a deciduous tree's bare branches and grayish brown or white bark almost make the tree appear dead. If you take a close look at the branches and twigs though, you will see tiny buds at their tips and along their sides. Here are some of those bump. The bumpy ring is where the twig started growing last spring. The distance to the end of the from here to the end of the twig tells you how much it has grown. These buds are like little packages full of next spring's beautiful leaves and flowers. Buds come in all sorts of sorts of all sorts of shapes, sizes, and textures. Many buds are sticky with a waterproof resin that keeps the new leaves inside warm and dry. Sweet sap. I bet we know what this is about. In the United States and Canada, sap from sugar maples is used to make delicious maple syrup in late winter and early spring. The sap will start to flow when daytime temperatures are warmer than 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, but nighttime temperatures are below freezing, which is the same temperature, below 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius. After the sap is extracted from the tree, it must be boiled for several hours. As the water evaporates, the sap becomes darker, thicker, and sweeter as it turns into syrup. Cold requirement. 
Not only can trees survive a cold winter, but they need a cold need the cold before they can grow again in the spring. Each species requires a certain number of cold days during the winter. The tree can only start to grow and flower again in spring once it has met its cold requirement. This helps protect the tree from flowering too early in the spring when cold weather could kill the blossoms. When winter days feel warmer, but the nights are still freezing cold, sometimes cracks appear on the tree with thin bark. The bark and inner would expand a little in the warm sun, especially on the south or west side of the tree. When the sun stops shining, the bark cools quickly and contracts faster than the inner wood. This can cause a crack. The colder the night, the bigger the crack. On really cold nights, you might hear a loud bang when the tree contracts. Forest regions. If you were walking through a forest on the west coast of British Columbia, you would see different trees than someone hiking in a forest in Florida. So if you were hiking over here versus over here. Look at the map to find the region where you live. So we live in Maine. It's this sort of yellow color here you can see. There are lots of different colors, but this one is northern. We live in the northern region. That makes sense. The main tree species, not Maine like our state, but Maine as in usual, are white pine, jack pine, red pine, eastern hemlock, white spruce, black spruce, balsam fir, yellow birch, sugar maple, trembling aspen, big tooth aspen, and American beech. I feel like I've seen all those trees before. You can see a little to the knee, the north of us is this like brown color, and that is the Acadian forest, which include things like red spruce, balsam fir, and yellow birch. A little to the south of us is this sort of teal, which is the central hardwood region, including black walnut, American sycamore, oak, maple, yellow poplar, ash, sweet gum hickory, basswood, and yellow buckeye. There are a lot more, but we're gonna go to the next page and talk about a terrific tree house. Trees make terrific homes for many animals, from tiny insects to birds to mammals such as squirrels. A place where an animal lives is called a habitat. All kinds of different animals may share one tree as a habitat, using it for food, shelter, and a place to raise their young. Take a look at the animals that call this sugar maple home. Many bird species, including a white-breasted nuthatch and an evening grosbeak, nest in tree holes or build their nests in the branches. They feed on the tree's seeds, sap, and buds, or at the insects that also live in the trees. Eastern cottontails and snowshoe hares feed on young maple stems and buds, especially in winter when other food is scarce. Porcupines climb into the tree and eat the inner bark during the winter months. White-tailed deer and moose eat seedlings, green leaves, and woody stems. Red squirrels feed on seeds and buds, and they also lick up sap from sap sucker holes. A variety of insects live and feed on the sugar maple leaves, including the Cecropia moth, the gall midgets, and snout beetles. A yellow-bellied bell sap sucker is a type of woodpecker, and it drills a distinct pattern of shallow holes in the bark. The holes fill with sap, and the bird laps it up with its brush-like tongue. Many other insects, including ants, wasps, and sap beetles, are attracted to the sap wells created by the sap suckers. Honeybees feed on flower pollen. Beginner tree watching. Tree watching is a great year-round hobby no matter where you live. Choose a tree in your neighborhood and watch it through the seasons. You can draw pictures or take photos and make notes of how the tree changes. You can use a checklist like this and a field guide to help you identify your tree. So you can look at the silhouettes or the general shape like this one, which is like a column. So it's called columnar, round, weeping, pyramid, or this one, which is shaped like a vase. Is the tree wider at the top or the bottom? Is the top pointed or rounded? Does it have branches all the way down the trunk? Leaves, are they broad and flat? Do they have needles or scales? If they're broad and flat, what shape are they? Palmate, palm-shaped. Lanceolate, spear-shaped. Ovate, egg-shaped. Spatulate, spoon-shaped. Chordate, heart-shaped. 
Are they simple or compound? If they're compound, do the leaflets grow opposite? See how they're all pairs? Or together, or alternate? See how they go one and then the other? What color are the leaves in each season? Flowers, cones, and fruits. Does the tree have cones? What shape and size are they? Where do they grow? Here's some white pine cones and some jack pine cones. Does the tree have flowers? What color, shape, and size are they? Here are cherry blossoms and yellow poplar flowers. What color is the ripe fruit? Is it hard like a nut or soft like a cherry? Here's an acorn, a gala apple, and an apricot. What size, shape, and color are the seeds? Bark. What color is the bark? Is the bark rough or smooth? Is it scaly, stringy, flaky, peeling, or ridged? Buds. Are the buds pointed or rounded? Are they sticky or dry? Do the buds smell? Do the buds grow opposite or alternate like this? Some things that are good to have for a tree watcher include binoculars, camera, a field guide, a notebook, and a pencil. More strange trees. Woohoo! Trees with knees in southern Florida, the mangrove tree. A mangrove's roots grow underwater, so the tree must send up special breathing roots that poke up above the mud at low tide. These roots are called knees, and they take in oxygen and other gases from the air and send them, send them down to the buried roots. Toxic trees. This is called the manchineal tree. All parts of the dangerous manchineal tree contain poisonous chemicals, and the rain sap from the tree can drip on your skin and cause a blister or a painful sore. The tree's fruit are called death apples, since they're toxic to anyone who accidentally takes a bite. Bean trees, American Midwest. This is also in Florida, by the way, The this one. Beans don't usually go in trees, but northern cat, catapult Catalpa trees produce bean-like seed pods that can be 20 inches long or more. These beans are not for eating, just for growing more trees. Camouflage trees, southern Ontario and the eastern half of the U.S. south to Florida. An American sycamore's bark is not very flexible, so it flakes off in large, irregular sheets as it grows. The new bark underneath is a different color, so the tree looks like a patchwork of green, white, brown, and gray, similar to a soldier's camouflage uniform. Antique trees, Utah, Nevada, and Eastern California. Unlike most trees, bristlecone pines thrive high up on the mountain where there is dry, shallow soil, and cold, strong winds. In fact, they are the world's oldest trees and are known to live over 5,000 years. These trees grow very slowly and may only be a few feet tall, even after hundreds of years. Lasting leaves, southern and eastern Canada, eastern U.S. to the Midwest. Even though they are deciduous, oak, beech, and hornbeam trees sometimes hang onto their leaves all winter, winter until they are finally blown or broken off in the spring. One idea for why this is, is that dead leaves protect the buds from hungry animals. This is a beech tree here. Endangered trees. If an animal is in danger, it can sometimes run away or hide to keep safe, but trees can't protect themselves from attacking insects or disease, logging, construction, or forest fires. Some trees, such as the Florida torea and the Virginia, Virginia um, round leaf birch are listed as endangered or threatened and may die out completely unless something is done to protect them. Fortunately, some trees are protected in national parks and nature reserves conservation groups, and local governments are also teaching landowners about the need to protect the habitats of these endangered species. You can help protect the trees in your neighborhood and across the country by following a few simple steps. Don't pull, out, pull off a tree's bark or carve into it. The bark shields the tree from insects, fungus, and diseases that can hurt or kill the tree. It also protects the cadmium, xylem, and phloem so that the water and nutrients can flow. Host a fundraiser for a conservation group that protects trees. Have a tree-themed bake sale or sell tickets for a guided hike led by a naturalist, a nature expert, through a local park or forest. Reduce, reuse, and recycle products made from paper by asking your parents to buy recycled paper, not using a lot of disposable plates or napkins, choosing products without a lot of packaging, 
recycling newspapers, writing in computer paper and cardboard, and writing or printing on both sides of the paper. Plant a tree. Planting a tree at home or school is a great activity for Earth Day or Arbor Day. The spring or end of the dry season is the best time to plant a tree from a seed. Choose a place where the tree will have room to grow and won't be in the way of other activities. Once your tree is planted, water it regularly to make sure it will have a long and happy life. You can look, for, look on the ground for a sprouted seed or even buy one. Dig a hole about six inches deep and loosen the soil in there to help the roots spread out. Put some compost in the hole and water it. Gently place the seed in the hole and cover it with soil. If it's already sprouted, be careful not to break off the roots. Keep the green leaves above the soil. You can build a small fence by placing a few sticks or twigs in the hole, um, in the ground around the hole and winding rope around the sticks. This will help animals and people keep away from the tree. If you're planting the seed in a flower pot, put gravel at the bottom for drainage. As your tree grows bigger, it might need a wooden stake to provide support for its trunk. And that is the end of this book. Now we're at the glossary, which defines some of the, the words that I said. And the index, which will help you if you were looking for something specific, like you wanted to know more about xylem, you could go specifically to that page. So that's the only book we're going to read today, but we're going to talk about two more books real fast. The first one is called Celebrities, Historic and Famous Trees of the World. This is by Margie Preus and illustrated by Rebecca Gibbon. And the really cool thing about this is it tells you about cool trees, one of which was even mentioned in that other book. So this tree right here, General Sherman, we were talking about, is that this tree is the biggest one in the whole world. But... There are all kinds of cool trees in here, including the oldest tree. This is the tallest type of tree. Huge, wide trees. Interesting trees that have knots and, and branches. Trees that grow in interesting places or have um, unique features to them and lots of other cool things. These are famous trees. You can check this book out. And it was mentioned a little bit in that book, but um, did you know that trees can help keep the environment clean? So this book called Deep Roots, How Trees Sustain Our Planets by Nikki Tate, explains how trees can help clean the earth, the air, how they can protect water, and even more. So I really suggest both of these books if you were interested in those trees. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening and learning about trees, and I hope to see you again soon.